Good evening. And welcome along to our Bible study. Um, tonight we conclude, I suppose, part two um, of the three parts that Revelation, I believe, is in. Not that I believe and therefore everybody else, but that's the way I divide it up. Um, we're, we're in the, the things that are happening now, moment that John sees, when he's caught up in the spirit from the Isle of Patmos. We're coming to the end of the what they call the seven churches. And tonight we're in Laodicea. And uh, it, it has stark warnings for us. It really has stark warnings for us as the church, as Christians. It has stark warnings for us. But before we go into it, we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to help us and to guide us through the different verses that we have in front of us. Uh, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are true to your word. And Lord, that we can understand in part, Lord, looking through a glass darkly, who you are and what you're expecting of us, Lord, and we can see partially the glory that you have. And it whets our appetite for that day when we will see you as you are. And Lord, we ask that you would search us and try us. And if there be any wicked way in us, Lord, convict us and lead us into truth. As we embark, Lord, in this, the seventh of the seven churches, give us strength, Lord, to hear what needs to be heard and to put right those things that we hear. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're in the church of Laodicea, and that in your Bible is found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through to verses 22. This, as I say, concludes the batch, what we know as the seven churches, the last of them. Uh, again, the, the letter part, the, all the letters are read together in every church. We've established that. This would be one of the longest parts, one of the more longer parts uh, but again, one of the more straightforward parts. And we're going to see that Laodicea actually has no commendation. Jesus doesn't mention anything good about Laodicea, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that uh, later on. So let's go to our map. It's a wee bit sad. Uh, I've blown the map up for this week because we're, we're in the last, the last one. I just want to track the journey through. We started on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1, John is caught up in the Spirit and shown the things that were, the things that are, and the things that must come shortly. And from Patmos, letters are sent out around the seven churches of Asia Minor West. We've been in Ephesus, we've been in Smyrna, we've been in Pergamum or Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis. Last week we were in Philadelphia, and this week, the last of them is Laodicea. Laodicea, let's take a moment or two just to consider the name. It's not just a, a name that's hard to say, Laodicea, but it's actually a name that combines two Greek words. That's what makes the name up, okay? Leo, which means people, and uh, Dikia, which means judgment, punishment, or vengeance. We find it in the Bible five times it's referenced, five times. New Testament, all in the New Testament. Book of Revelation, obviously, but also the book of Colossians. And we're going to see later on that Laodicea was actually very close to the city of Colossae uh, and shared some elders, uh, church leaders between the two. We're going to see that in the scriptures later on. But when you combine this, it can be looked at two ways, Okay. Big clue for where we're going tonight. Perspective, how we view a thing, okay? Um, one way it can look at the people are judging, or the people are punished, or the people are avenged. The people rule, it's their, their choice. Another way to look at it is that the people have been judged, or the people are to be punished, or the people are to be avenged. So it can be looked at two ways. There is, there can be a slight back and forth on that. But I want you to bear that in mind, okay, as we go into this. Perspective. What things might appear to us that might be different to other people and vice versa. Let's have a, a look at the holiday snaps. Uh, not mine, but snatched off uh, Google Images. Um, this is the theatre. Now, 
Week seven, or sorry, week eight, seven churches, we should be well used to seeing images like this. We've seen this in pretty much every other town. These structures are 100% different than the structures that we've seen every other week, though. And again, we're going to get into that. What you'll see, do you see the cranes in the background, or, or dotted around? Uh, in the city, where ancient Laodicea lies this day, they use that amphitheater, even to this day, for performances and musicals, that kind of thing. Uh, and those cranes are housing lights. And round about the outside, there's uh, these posters, like flags that you would see down the town outside a certain stall or shops when they're having promotionals. Uh, there's some sort of uh, event that's going to be taking place. So that is even used today. It's in such great nick, okay? The next one. This is... Uh, Anybody want to hazard a guess at what that could be? A viaduct, an aqueduct, yes. This was a system uh, that was invented many, many hundreds of years ago, uh, sort of in the, the Roman times, Greek times. It carries water from one area to another, okay? Viaducts are land, aqueducts are water. And that's what they do. They carry water down from the mountaintops or from some other area and allow it to trickle along the top and uh, arrive at the town. In fact, that was one of the strategies of the ancient armies, which was to destroy or put out the middle of a viaduct and thus stop fresh water getting into some cities. Laodicea has her own very complex network of aqueducts, completely different from every other aqueduct that we have seen. The next picture, what's one of the things that we use water for? Washing, I hope. Um, these are Laodicean baths. Now, we're familiar with talking about Roman baths. These are Laodicean baths. Completely different, 100% different. They're not the same as Roman baths. They're completely different. They're Laodicean baths. And again, we're going to get into that later. The next picture, I like this picture. It's a gymnasium. It's, I don't like it because it's a gymnasium, because I have no affection for gyms whatsoever. Jim as in G-Y-M, not J-I-M. But it's, the, it's the, uh, the work that has went into it. Gymnasiums were like a spa. A gym today, when you go to it, you go to work out. In those days, there were spas, treatments were had. There was warm and cold water in it. You know, all to try and rejuvenate you. It would have been a very social area, uh, and it would be a very men-only area as well. These are Laodicean gymnasiums. So uh, it's good to see. We've got a, a picture of an artist's impression of what Laodicea may have looked like uh, maybe about six to 700 years ago. Um, you can see the aqueduct has been drawn in. And if your eye is good for this picture, in the middle of the picture, you can actually see the top of the theater just poking out. The, the thing about uh, Laodicea's um, theater is they dug down rather than build up. Uh, it was Sardis who put it on the side of a, a cliff. They dug out the cliff. All different techniques to help them keep the cost down, just, you know, to support the structure. Later, see it sunk hers down. And you can see the mountains in the background. Okay? We're going to have a look at those mountains again if we just flick on to the next slide. Later, see it is found under the modern-day Turkish city of Denizili. Now, I have looked up Google and listened to the pronunciation of it. And even then, I don't think I'm still pronouncing it right, Denizili. Um, more people live in Denizili today than lived in Laodicea, which is the norm anyway. Um, some of the other cities were vice versa. Uh, and it's probably a leftover from the wealth that was in Laodicea that people still flock to this. But you can see past the mist at the top, that isn't the sky. That's actually a mountain view up there. They're surrounded uh, or sorry, to the north, they're, they're, they're uh, encapsulated by, by mountains, which is important. Let's have a, a little look at the history of Laodicea. It was a well-established town on major trade routes from the west to the east, okay? Smyrna, Ephesus, Philadelphia, and other points would have went through Laodicea onward east, other towns that we have looked at, other cities that we have looked at on our journeys had the same. But no one 
was as rich in wealth as Laodicea was. It was a very prosperous city. We can also tell uh, that it was originally established almost uh, sort of just around 2000 BC. That's nearly 4,000 years ago. Okay? Originally, it was called Diospolis. Okay? Diospolis. That was its original name. And it was a very small town, but it grew up because it was on trade routes. Okay? The Hittites, which is an ancient uh, empire, claimed it as a city in the 19th century BC. Okay? So it started to form as a small city in its own right, Diopolis, Dios, Diospolis, but then the Hittite Empire took it over. Okay? In 900 BC, about a thousand years later, the Phrygian Empire took it over. They captured it. But that was a time with a lot of wars. And very quickly after they took it, the Lydians took it and they renamed it Roas, which is a word that derives from their own language. And it became a town called Roas. So very quickly, from its foundation, over a thousand years, it suffers changing of hands. Okay? Different empires, Hittites, Friggin Empire, the Lydian Empire, all have their turn at taking it over. This wealthy outpost on the easterly road. In 250 BC, the Seleucid Empire takes it over or captures Rojas, and the Seleucid king, Antiochus II, renames the town after his wife. His wife's name was Laodice, okay? And that's where the city that we read about in the book of Revelations gets its name, Laodicea, okay? Laodice was the wife of Antiochus II, and he named it for her, okay? Which was something that was quite common. Some of them named it after a daughter. Uh, if you remember, we were, were looking at cities. Others named it after their brother's nicknames, which we were looking at last week. And this week, we're looking at somebody who named the town when they conquered it after their, um, their wife. And this stuck for a long time until the Ottoman Empire and the, the sort of Muslim and the Turks came in and they changed it uh, to the modern city that we see. In 190 BC, 200 years before the time of Christ, it became part of the kingdom of Pergamos. Pergamum was a very influential city. Pergamos, we've looked at it in the seven letters. And it became, later say, it became part of that kingdom. Now we know that Pergam, Pergamus was uh, attractive to the Roman Empire. So whenever the Romans came along, they didn't conquer Laodicea. It just transferred its governance. There was no war, no battle. The Roman Empire took it over. And a historian called Josephus records that there was a very large Jewish community in Laodicea. So all these things we have dotted throughout secular history and I hope you understand that this build up that I give the reason why we dig into their history because Jesus is writing to them at a time where Jesus is relevant to them at the time when God speaks to us today by his spirit through prophets or tongues and interpretation or, or through his word he speaks relevant to us today and we need to understand that so that we can understand the message. And this is why we go through the history, okay? The city was built, as I said, on trade and commerce. Now, the major financial um, sort of giants in Laodicea were banks, gold refiners, and merchants. Now, what I learned was it's not merchants like markets that we would have, but it's like big warehouses. So the only way I could sort of... Um, bring it up to today's state, it would be like a Tesco's would have their headquarters there, uh, Littles would have their headquarters there, Sainsbury's would have their headquarters there, maybe a wee bit like Cutter's Wharf over in London, that big financial institute. This is what Laodicea became, a financial powerhouse. In fact, we do hear this, they had a trade route to the Yellow River, which was on the, board, or it was on the shores of the China Sea. Is that not surprising? Does that flick over it? 
I had, when I read about this, I had to go to Google Maps, okay? Now, that's a bit hard to take out, but from Turkey to the Yellow River on the China Sea, it is 12,516 kilometers long. And if you and I were to take a walk along that road, <laughs> it would take us approximately 110 days to walk from Laodicea out to the Yellow River Junction with the China Sea. Could you imagine waiting at the Yellow River Junction with the China Sea for your Amazon parcel that had to be delivered by a man from Laodicea who had a donkey himself and maybe his son? You'd have to, you weren't getting it next day delivery with Prime, no. You were getting it 108 to 110 days later and that's in good weather. And they had a trade route now, they had some special things that they traded in themselves, that they produced themselves. But most of the stuff that came back and forth through Laodicea was on its way from somewhere else through Laodicea on its way to somewhere else again. And Laodicea just happened to pick up on the business east, especially to that. I thought that was amazing. We look at global trade today, and it's all done with a click of a button. We can order something in on Amazon from Germany or France or other, some other part of the world and have it in a couple of days. And here, people were waiting on their milk being delivered by Tesco's delivery. It had to be the long life milk, definitely. They couldn't have been get, getting away with the full cream milk on that one. Definitely couldn't. So Laodicea suffered. The area that Laodicea was in was a very volcanic area, Okay. That whole area, that whole western side, and we've we seen it last week when we were looking at Philadelphia, the burnt area, that it was very, very susceptible to earthquakes. And in 62 AD, 30 years after the death of Christ approximately, that area suffered a major earthquake. Do you remember last week when we were looking at Philadelphia? Whenever they suffered through the earthquake, the Romans rebuilt, Tiberius rebuilt and gave a lot of money pumped into it. This time, it wasn't the Roman emperors that put money into it. It was the wealthy citizens of Laodicea rebuilt Laodicea. Do you see the difference? That's why when we were looking at the ruins, I was telling you that these bars aren't Roman bars. The stadiums aren't Roman stadiums. The gymnasiums aren't Roman gymnasiums. The wealthy citizens of Laodicea seen these things in other cities on their travels and built them for themselves. They established a town and a city for themselves, built upon their own wealth, not the wealth of kings, Greek kings, Phrygian kings, Phoenician kings, Roman emperors. They built it out of their own money without the help of Rome. And this self-sufficiency bred into them pride. Laodicea became a highly successful commercial hub. Laodicea becomes the epitome for opulence and luxury. They had their theatres, they had their baths, their gymnasiums, their aqueducts, and their own stadium. In fact, when I was reading about their history, what it reminded me of was modern-day Dubai. That's a picture of the Seal Hotel, I think it's nicknamed. The Seal Hotel, one of the most elaborate, opulent, it's not five stars, it's like a ten-star hotel in Dubai. Uh, Dubai is seen as sort of the playground to the rich and famous of the world. They all flock to Dubai. It's full of luxurious items. It's full of, you, you name it, you can get it. Or even the, the policemen, they don't drive... Uh, Volkswagen or Vauxhall insignias. They do drive things like Lamborghinis and they drive things like Porsche cars. That's what the police force drive because everybody in the street, they don't own, you know, uh, little uh, Fiat uh, 500s. They own the supercars. They're so rich. That's where the mega rich live. And later she reminds me of this. This place that is a trade center. That's what Dubai is, a trade center. But it builds a name for itself. Dubai didn't grow up or, or um, develop through any other investment from any other country. They made a name for themselves. Let's look at some of the things that they produced for themselves, okay? Textiles. 
In the ancient world, it's okay for us today, we can go up to the Linen Hall Museum. Behind the Linen Hall Museum, there's a wool shop and there's one down the street from it. You can go in and buy any color of wool you want, wool that's even multicolored. You can buy it all there. But in the ancient world, they had to dye all their natural fibers. They had no uh, synthetic fibers. They were all natural fibers. But due to the, uh, the, the environment where they lived, there was a special uh, shape breed of sheep that were all black sheep of their family. Okay, there was no white sheep. They were all black sheep. And what was even better about it is their, their coats were very compact and glossy. And what they used to do is they used to use them in rugs. They used to use them in carpets. They used to sell them as raw um, yarns. And, and, and they would go to the Yellow River in China. They would go back to Rome. And the Odyssea was known for their black glossy wool. It was famous and you could only get it in Laodicea. Okay? One of the other things that they were famous for is they had a famous medical school in Laodicea. You see, in the ancient world, medical care came with finance. The more finance you had, the better physicians you could have. In fact, that sounds a wee bit like today as well, doesn't it? If you have a bit of finance, you can go private and get better physicians, or at least get the, the same physician who would have treated you on the NHS. You just get them a little bit quicker if you pay for the money. The same happened to Laodicea. Because of the wealth, it attracted uh, good um, physicians. They set up their own school. And one of the things that they produced in Laodicea was a special eye salve, an effective eye salve. A lot of the physicians back then were very experimental. There was a lot of what I would call snake oil sellers. You know, there wasn't really doing anything for you. It was just, you know, all made to look as if it would help you. But for some reason, whatever they developed was actually uh, effective. And Aristotle, who is a Greek philosopher, makes mention of the Phrygian powder. In his era, the, uh, the, um, the latest year was under the Phrygian Empire. Okay, And he refers to it as the Phrygian powder, which was, we believe, or the history books teach us, that it was put into water, a powder that was put into water, and then put in your eyes to help with infection, tiredness, you name it, it solved it. Okay, And they were very famous for it. These things all have a meaning when we get to the letter. Let's look at their geography again. Okay, We zoom in, and we see Laodicea down in the bottom left. Okay, we see the town up north, Heropolis. Now that's up closer to the mountains that we were speaking, that we've seen in the, in the different pictures. And down to the southeast, we see Colossae. Now we know the town of Colossae, or at least you should know the town of Colossae, because that's where the book of Colossians, that's where Paul writes his letter to the Colossians, to the church in that city. But here's the thing. These three cities were all within a day's walk of each other. They were very, very close. Okay, very, very close. Laodicea had a partnership. Their aqueducts went out to Heropolis because Heropolis had a hot springs. You know, like the volcanic springs that you would have had? Very good for, you know, um, rheumatoid arthritis, very good for skin conditions, all these different... Uh, uh, ailments that these hot springs were good for and the water that was in them was very good and the Laodiceans built aqueducts out to Heropolis and then they brought that water in to Laodicea but here's the thing it records in history that by the time the hot springs got to Laodicea the water was no longer hot it was lukewarm we go down to Colossae Colossae, we have the fresh, cool water springs that comes down off the mountains near the south coast, near the sea. Again, Laodicea, looking for the cool waters of Colossae, built aqueducts from Colossae to capture their fresh, cool water springs. But guess what? By the time the cool water gets to Laodicea, it's no longer cool, but it's Look warm. That might have something to do with this evening, okay? Here's something that we're going to have a look at very briefly that we've never had a look at in any other church. We're going to have a wee bit of a look at church history 
with regards to Laodicea, and we get our sources for this history from the Bible. Laodicea, that church, was possibly founded, they say, by a man called Epaphras. Epaphras. Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Heropolis. So those three towns that were very close together, when you read through the book of Colossae, you see that whenever they're writing, Paul's writing letters to Colossae, he, he also instructs them in different places to go read the letters in Laodicea. And uh, we can see from this that there is a house group or a church up in Heropolis as well. So Epaph Epaphras, who is with Paul at this moment, one of their own is from that area. And they, they reckon that Epaphras helped set up, because he was one of their own, he was one from that region, he helped set up the churches in that tri-city area. Heropolis, Colossae, Laodicea. Okay? Listen to this. It is thought that a man called Archippus takes on the post at Laodicea after Epaphras, who possibly started it or was definitely involved in the ministry in that area. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, we read this. Paul's writing, he says, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So what we pick up from this is that Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. And he said, you guys in Colossae and Laodicea, swap letters. There's benefits for you both in the letters. Swap the letters. And say to Archippus, who is in Laodicea, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. That sounds like great encouragement, doesn't it? But when you look at the words that are used in the Greek and the words that we see as fulfill, it means level up, live up to, rise up. Paul is encouraging Archippus to pull his socks up. Okay? Now that echoes what Jesus writes in his letters to the Laodiceans, that they need to repent, that they're not doing as good as they think they're doing. And Paul echoes to Archippus, Paul says to Archippus, and this could be, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying this could be a reason why the church at Laodicea isn't doing well when the letter from Christ arrives, penned by John in Laodicea. It could have been because of a lackluster, or may I say, a lukewarm zeal of their leadership under Archippus. That's all from Scripture. Okay? So what did Jesus write to the church at Laodicea? Let's read. As I said, it's Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through to 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now just pause there for a moment. I said that this was the church that made God sick. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, listen to these words and listen to where we've been. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, 
that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now looking at the history and the build up and coming into the letters, by now, week eight, the seventh church, you should for yourselves already be picking up on some of the things that would be relevant to the people of Laodicea, yeah? White raiments, lukewarm, eye salve, thinking that you're rich. All these things we've discussed, that is their culture. That is the spirit of the day in Laodicea. And Jesus writes to them, Concerning it, let's look at the structure. Remember the structure? A description of the author, a commendation, a rebuke, a correction, and a promise. And guess what? No commendation. Jesus hadn't said anything good about it. Sardis was the other one. Nothing good said. Sardis was reminded of her pride. Do you remember? Up on top of that hill, thinking that they would never be conquered conquered every time the exact same way and each person who took over thought they wouldn't be conquered that way again and what comes before what comes after pride a fall and here we have something similar to the later scenes caught up in their pride they think that they are rich but really they are poor and naked no commentation Revelations 3, 14. And to the angel of the church of the later saints write, these things says the amen and the faithful and true witness and the beginning of the creation of God. Three descriptions of the author. Let's look at them. Oh, by the way, each of these, it goes without saying, they're all to some extent found in Revelation chapter 1. So it refers back to, to the introduction. And remember, all the churches are hearing this at the same time. So the three, introduction, or the three descriptions we have is amen, faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. A strange statement there that would make you think things that aren't true, but we'll get into that, okay? Amen. Amen means true. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you. Jesus says that many times in the King James Version. Truly, truly, I say unto you. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says this. And, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. True. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. True. Isaiah 65 Verse 16, so that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he who swears on the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. Jesus introduces himself to the later saints as truth. As truth. Because they need to hear truth. Because what they are allowing themselves to believe is false. Their perspective is wrong. Jesus in his letter has told them to go by eye salve. You need your eyes seen to, okay? The faithful and true witness, Revelations chapter one, verse five. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own Blood. Revelation chapter 1, there we have it, the faithful witness. We also find it in Isaiah as well. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 4. Indeed, I have given him, speaking of the Messiah, as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Jesus is a witness of the truth. In fact, he is the truth. I am the way, the 
truth, and the life. Jesus is coming as a witness. He's bearing witness. I'm coming to you with the truth. You hear all these fancy things being said to you. You hear all these things, how well you're doing, how great your city looks, how wealthy you are, how how forward-thinking you are with all these inventions in your own uh, buildings, in your own structures, in your aqueducts. I'm here to tell you the real story and witness against you that your works aren't good. This description, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, if we just flick that next slide over in, when we look at that, we can be fooled into thinking that Jesus has described himself as the first of the creation, the first one to be created, which is complete heresy, by the way. It's not so. All things were created by him, and all things were created for him. And all things move and have their being because of him. That's scriptural, okay? Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. So let's investigate that. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. If you want to close those windows, I know the temperature's dropped considerably. If you want to close those windows over, that'll be great. John, if you could maybe. So what is this title? What, What does it mean? How is Jesus introducing himself to the later saints. Well, this is not a description of what Jesus is, being one of the first cre- cre- creatures. No, it's actually a title of Christ. And instead of being used for someone who is created, it's used in rank and honor. It's actually the title, not of creation, but it's a title for the creator. In fact, it probably better reads, instead of saying the beginning of the creation of God, but rather the origin of the creation of God. That's where creation finds its birthplace. That's where creation finds its beginnings in the origin. Jesus comes and says, I am the one who was there at the beginning. I have created all things. Look around you. Look at the structures that I have created. The mountains where you bring your cool water from. The mountains where you bring down the hot springs from. All these things I have created. I am the original creator. I am the original architect. And that's how he's bringing himself to the Laodiceans. You see, the Laodiceans are what we would call today, they're believing their own hype. And Jesus is here to bear true witness to them that no, I am the great I am. And that's how he introduces himself to the church of the latest saints. Let's have a look at their commendation. We'll move on. (laughs) They don't have a commendation. I will say one thing though. In the course of reading through this letter, they are not without hope, amen? Amen. They are not without hope. The very fact that Jesus pens them the letter through John says that there is hope. And Jesus mentions one of the greatest gifts given to humanity. The greatest gift given to humanity, I believe, is Jesus. One of the other great gifts that is given to humanity is repentance. Because without repentance, we can't make of effect what Jesus has done on the cross. The cross is a great gift. Jesus himself is a great gift. And repentance is a great gift. People just talk about this word repentance like it's some sort of bad, oh, repent, repent, oh, we hate to hear that word in church. No. There's nothing better hearing at a birthday party. Here comes the cake. It's one of the best parts of the whole party, isn't it? The birthday cake comes out and some of us are reaching. I know I'm reaching an age where I'm in between a 40-watt bulb and a 60-watt bulb. I'm reaching an age where there's going to be more, more, it's better to put a light bulb on my cake than there is to put candles on it. But a cake is the best part of the party and it comes out and everybody gets to share of it. And it's the same with the repentance. And thank God, even though Laodicea doesn't have a good word said about it, he still says you have the gift of repentance. Repent and overcome. Amen? And even in the course of the season, when we're looking at some of these things, and you might get down on yourself because you think, okay, my perspective of myself has been wrong when I align it and the Spirit speaks to me. Don't get down. Praise God, because you can enact, you can activate the gift of repentance and come to him. One of my favorite verses, come, let us reason together, though your sins be as red as scarlet. They can be as white as wool. 
Come, let us reason together. The God of the universe says, let's talk. Let's talk. The rebuke reads as follows. I know your works. It's not good. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Coffee. Mmm. I don't like it. Um, it's really great whenever we get a coffee, even if we can flick that slide across. It's even great when we get a coffee with cream in it or maybe a hot chocolate with cream on it and marshmallows and everything that goes with that. You go to Costa or you go down to T2. That's worth a free coffee at T2, Aiden. T2 in the mall and you'll get yourself a coffee or a hot chocolate with cream and sprinkles on it, whatever. Coffee is great when it's warm, hot. Drink it while it's hot. Today you can even get coffees that are iced frappuccinos. And coffee is great when it's cold, sweet. There's a lovely flavour of it. But there's nothing worse than getting a great cup of coffee and you're drinking through it and you forget about it if you're reading or watching TV and you lift the cup and you drink it and it's went look warm. It makes you sick. And no matter if it's your favourite brand of Mellow Birds or maybe it's your favourite, some people maybe like it like that, Sandra. Okay, there's always one, okay. But the majority of us don't like it when it goes like that. It's the same with a cup of tea. There's nothing worse than a lukewarm cup of tea. And you know something, you'll never get a cup of tea that tastes the same as the great cup of tea you were having. You can go to the kitchen and try to make it over again. It doesn't work. The word to vomit, emeo, okay? Emeo, I will spew you out of my mouth. This Greek word is only used in one place in the whole of the New Testament. And it's here. It's here. Laodicea is an emetic to God. An emetic is something that makes you sick. In ancient times, whenever somebody had maybe ingested maybe poisonous berries, a child maybe had ingested, poisonous berries or maybe one of those Roman emperors who was uh, maybe getting poisoned and what they would try to do is back in the ancient days there were very very rare poisons that could kill you straight away most of them made you sick over a period of time and eventually you died so there's always a chance that they could help and one of the things that they had to do immediately was to make you vomit excuse me that if there was anything still in your system to get it out and what they used to do was make you drink you got it look warm water. Now it took an awful lot but eventually you would end up being sick because it overpowers your liver and it makes you throw up. Okay? Now they developed that through the years. They started to add salt. When salt started to become more available through the trade routes, they would put the salt into it. And you know yourself if you drink salt water or even if you've been to the beach and maybe take in too much sea salt when, uh, uh, when you're out in the water it makes you sick makes you vomit. As they developed, they got chemicals for it and drugs for it, all things to make you sick. And in fact, if people have overtaken or overdosed, one of the things they will do nowadays is inject them with an emetic to make them sick. But it all began back in the times of Laodicea with lukewarm water or lukewarm water and salt, depending on what era it was. But it was always carried within lukewarm water. Cold water, no. It was too refreshing, too sweet. Hot water even tastes nice as well. But cold or lukewarm water is an emetic. And God is saying to Laodicea, you're not hot, you're not cold. You went lukewarm. You went lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. And you're making me sick. Not terrible words to hear from God. Remember the pride of self-sufficiency that began to grow. Revelations 3, 17, because you say, I am rich, having become wealthy and have need of nothing. What does nothing mean? It means nothing. It therefore means they have no need of God. No need of God. They can take him or leave him. That's the temptation of self-sufficiency. There's, it's, it's also a myth. 
There's no man or woman on the planet that is self-sufficient. Because every human being needs company. Interaction of some sort. They need something. Nobody is born into this world and already self-sufficient. It's a myth. But when we believe it, it means, and it's ultimate, when it's taken up to the nth degree, it means that you can take or leave God because you don't need him. Because you have need of nothing. And do not know their perspective is all wrong. They don't know. They think they're wealthy. They think they're self-deficient. What they don't know is they're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It reminded me of the, you ever hear the old story, The Emperor's New Clothes? where these guys come into the town and they, they uh, tell the emperor all oh, these fashionable threads and, and textiles and there's nothing there. Uh, only intelligent people can see them. It's a myth. It's a spun yarn. And off the king went down the street in a suit made out of these fashionable threads and he was completely naked. And people were laughing at him. That's the latest science. They'd believed their own hype. And they were naked, poor and wretched. They thought they were great. And really God seen them as the complete opposite. Self-perception can be misleading. Self-perception can be misleading. Okay? I love our new house because there's no big mirror in the bathroom. It's a small mirror that only your face can fit into. So... If, as long, as long, I, I, think, I think I'm nice to look at, okay? I think from here up, okay? I think I'm okay. So I don't have to worry about from here down, okay? I don't need to worry about that, okay? From here up, everything looks great. But that is self-perception. If I was to come step back into a bigger mirror, my perception may change. Churches in the letters that were written by Christ in the start of the book of Revelation, churches who thought they were doing well we're doing poorly. Laodicea, Sardis, too, for an example. Churches who thought they were doing poorly were doing well. Smyrna, who were under constant persecution. Thyatira, who were under, or even Jesus said, the throne of Satan is in your city. These, we're not battling the forces. We're not overcoming. We're not showing great revivals. We're not showing this and that. But they were faithful to his word and didn't deny his name. And he gave them a great commendation for it. But other ones who thought they were brilliant were doing wrong. James chapter 1 verses 23 to 24 says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. Now before I go any further, I just want to explain some people take one and leave the other. You, you, you need both here. It's not one or the other. It's not you have to be a doer rather than just a hearer. And it's not about being a hearer rather than being a doer. You need to be a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. Okay? So some people make that mistake. Okay? If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing, him, uh, observing his natural face in a mirror. That's me in the bathroom, just with the mirror, okay? For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So I look in the mirror, looking well, I walk away, and my false self-perception, I start to build upon it, okay? And what James is saying here, when we come to God's word, it shows us exactly who we are because it comes from God's perspective but the fool comes away from the Bible thinking that he's great thinking that everything's okay and that's the of say they think that they're doing great and they're not we need Christ's perspective and to adjust ours accordingly I suppose the best way to look at it is somebody leading somebody who's blind they rely on the perspective of the one who has sight, the one who has understanding, the one who knows the way. We need to adjust our course in instruction from the ones who know the way. And to navigate this world, we need to be listening to Jesus, which means we need to be hearing the word, which means we need to be doing according to the word. 
We need Christ's perspective in the situation. Can I put it another way to you? Okay? Then we come from a different angle. And let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. I've entitled these verses, I Never Knew You. Okay? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? And you listen to what they're doing, okay? What they say they've been doing. Lord, have we not prophesied? These are gifts of the Spirit. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? They're debating with Jesus. Have we not done these things? And done many wonders in your name? They're, they're, they're looking at what their account said. We, we, we prophesied. We've been involved in deliverance ministry. We, we've done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What's wrong with this picture? Well, surely if I... Surely if I'm prophesying, I'm on the right track. Surely if I'm praying for people who are possessed and, and demons are being cast out of them in the name of Jesus, I'm on the right track, yeah? And Jesus sees it a different way. If you didn't do this to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. A cup of water in my name? Visit those in prison? Visit the sick? Clothe the naked? Feed the hungry? That's the perspective of Christ. That's the perspective that we need to be leaning towards and adjusting ourselves. It's not about Corinthians chapter 13. If I prophesy, if I have the tongues of angels, if I have all these and have not love, then I am like a clanging cymbal. A clanging cymbal is annoying to the ear. If it's not played properly, it's annoying to the ear. And if we do not have love, we're annoying to the ear of Christ. If we're not listening to his word, we're annoying him. If we're lukewarm, we're making him sick. We look as if we're in the kingdom, but we're denying the power thereof. The power for what? What is the power of the kingdom? Love. Love. God is love. Christ came and gave himself because of love. Christ adopts you into the kingdom because of love. It's all about love. If you do not have love, you have nothing. This is the perspective of the kingdom. So how do we correct, correct ourselves? Well, if you're blind and you don't know where to go and somebody does know the way to go, how do you correct yourself? You listen. And you go with your guide. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 to 19, Jesus gives him advice. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous, amen, and repent. Do you know they were so far off the beaten track, it was unreal. They thought they were doing brilliant. They were making God sick. What a fearful place to be in. And yet... In Christ, there was hope. Amen? Repent. It's not an awful word, brothers and sisters. It's not an awful word. It's right up there where salvation is of the Lord. It's right up there with God is love. It's right up there with Jesus is King of kings and Lord of loves. lords. It's repentance. It is the greatest gift, one of the greatest gifts given to mankind. Let's dig into this. Buying gold, wearing raiments, I sell. Buy gold tried in the fires of God, not the gold refined in Laodicea. Laodicea was known for their gold refineries. Buy gold from God. Riches in heaven, not riches on earth. Riches in heaven where rust and moth do not corrupt, not riches on earth where thieves can break in and steal. Jesus said these things. These are things that should be familiar to them. Wear a white raiment, given to you by the bridegroom, clothing given to you, he, 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 garments of praise, his righteousness, his purity. 
Take on yourself these things, not the glossy black wool from Laodicea. That's the direct opposition where, where, where Christ is going in this letter. Not your black glossy wool, not the black sheep wool, not that which is produced in Laodicea that everybody thinks is great. No, we're the clothing I give to you. <coughs> you spiritual eye salve, not the famous powders of Laodicea. It's your spiritual eyes that need to be opened, not your physical eyes to be opened. Laodicea equals the world. Now let's read that again. Buy gold tried in the fire of God, not the gold refined in the world. Wear white raiment, not the glossy black wool from the world. Use spiritual eye salve, not the famous powders of the world. Listen to me. Don't just be hearers, but be doers also. Here's a famous picture. I'm sure you've seen the likes. If not this one, you've seen something like it. Right in the middle of this hard letter for all the churches to be listening to, remember, not just Laodicea, and it was too Laodicea, the rest of them would have heard it. I'm sure they would have been pondering themselves. We have this strange verse right in the middle of it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Have you heard that verse before? This is a great verse. You've probably heard this on gospel services. We've heard it in gospel services all through our lives, those of us who've been in churches, evangelists come from the far stretches of the north coast down to Belfast and Lisbon, and they tell us all about, behold, I stand at the door. And it's great. It's just out of context. It's not to the world this part is written. Shock horror is to the church. Jesus is saying, I'm standing at the door of your church. On the outside, knocking. And if anybody hears me, if there's anybody in there hearing from me, is, is this for real? We're in the church. We're always hearing from God, aren't we? Jesus says, I'm on the outside of the door. Do you remember in the beginning of Revelation chapter 1, where was he? In the midst of the candlesticks. Where is he in Laodicea? He's outside the church. He won't go in. Not because he's not invited. Be sure of that. Because Jesus walked through the wall of the upper room when the doors were locked. He doesn't need the key. And that picture, if you go back one, Eden, and that picture, and in pictures like this, famously they don't put a door handle on the outside because the handle's on the inside. You have to open the door. Go back to the verse, Eden. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, you have to invite Jesus in. But here's the, here's the kicker. He will not come in. My mum uses this verse. He's a gentleman. Jesus doesn't push his way in. Yes. I'm not contradicting my mother, but I want to say something else. He will only come in under his conditions. It has to be his way or no way. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I, can you hear his voice? If you hear his voice tonight, then open the door. I urge you to open the door. And let me tell you something. I know it's out of context for a gospel meeting, but if anybody is watching this tonight who isn't saved or anybody who's watching this in the future who doesn't know Christ as your Savior, I also, in this format, I will still say, if you hear Christ speaking to you this evening, open the door to him. Because without him, you're going to come to a fall. Because you might think you're doing well, but you're not. You need his perspective on life. Because he is the one who created and gave life. He is the engineer who put it all together. He knows how it should run. He's standing at the door and knocking. Are you lukewarm? Open the door. Come, let us reason together. Jesus says, if you open the door, I will come in to him. If you invite him and in, I will come in to him. I will come in and dine with him. I will have fellowship with him. The promise. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. 
I will, I, as I also overcame and sat down with my father at his throne. The promise is, today Jesus sits on the universal throne of heaven. He sits on the throne of heaven with the Father. But all the prophecies, the messianic prophecies, all the prophecies of the Old Testament, prophecies of the New Testament, statements by Jesus himself, says that one day he will sit upon King David's throne. And that is an earthly throne. When he overcame, he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the power on high. He sat down beside his father in heaven. But when he comes to King David's throne on earth, all those who overcome will sit and rule with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. If we endure, if we endure. Do you know you can enjoy while you're enduring? You can enjoy while you're enduring. I'm enjoying fellowship with Christ as I endure my, my situation in the world. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we overcome, we will reign with him. Amen? Amen. I'm going to finish this evening um, very quickly now. I want to read an inscription from... 1170 AD, I haven't read it on the thing, so I can't, 1170 AD. And it was written on the outside of a church in Lübeck, Germany, Lübeck Cathedral in Germany. Listen to these words. Think of the Laodiceans. Think of him standing on the outside of the door. Think of the people on the inside. I prophesied in your name. We've cast out demons in your name. We've done many good things. I didn't know you, he says. Listen to this. You call me master. And obey me not. You call me light. And see me not. You call me way. And walk me not. You call me life. And desire me not. You call me wise. And follow me not. You call me fair. And love me not. You call me rich. And ask me not. You call me eternal. And seek me not. You call me gracious. And trust me not. You call me noble. And serve me not. You call me mighty and honor me not. You call me just and fear me not. If I condemn you, blame me not. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a message to the Laodicea. It's a message to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Thyatira, Philadelphia, and us. It's a message to us. Come to him and buy spiritual eye salve. Don't rely on self-perspective. See yourself as the spirit is bringing you to see yourself. Listen to him. He wants to lead you in a way. It's important, the things that are. These messages that we have heard throughout all the seven churches, they're important for us today because these are the things that are. And it's important that we understand them. Next week. Next week, we take a deep breath before the plunge. There's a big dive to take into what's about to come up, but before we get into the rest of it, what I want to do is to have a look at the message out of each of the seven churches, just to refresh our memory of what is, what we should be looking at, how we should be uh, bringing ourselves up along the ruler of Scripture to make sure that we are on the right track, that we don't need to adjust, that we're walking in fellowship with him, and not just in service, but in fellowship. We'll also be looking at the things that were, Christ in all his glory will be going back to chapter 1 to jump in to chapter 4 because we need to understand again how John perceived Christ because a lot of the things that are there are going to be very relevant when we get into the, the latter half of Revelation because Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, how he is. So we need to see how John's seen him so we can get some of these um, keys and some of these phrases. Another thing we're going to do is look at some phrases 
that maybe the Old Testament, uh, in particular, we may look at next week, depending on time, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue. That will help us as we go forward. So next week is sort of a wee bit more relaxed. Next week is sort of a, a sort of a regrouping and uh, checking that we've got everything in our bags that we need to leave West Turkey and head to the throne room of God. That's where we're heading to. But next week, like the little boy with his armbands on, we're going to take a deep breath before we plunge in to the pool. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word because it is truth. And it is a mirror that I can see myself in and see the man that I am. I thank you that your word is available for everyone. Lord, I thank you that your guidance by your Holy Spirit is available for all those who will come to you believing that you are God and open their ear and do what you're asking them to do. Father, it's not control. You're not a dictator or a tyrant. You're a father who's showing us the way to walk in. Lord, help us listen to the lesson of Laodicea and realize that self-sufficiency is not where it's found, but rather we need to lean heavily upon the everlasting arms. Father, I ask that you bless all those that are listening in tonight and those that are here tonight. Give them their portion, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements before we finally sign off. Um, Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, it's myself speaking. Monday morning prayer support, 11 to half 12. Wednesday next week, half seven to half eight prayer meeting. And then the deep breath before the plunge next Thursday night. God bless.